introduction, uh, Brian. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, there's a lot of light here, and um, I just want to start by saying that it's a great privilege uh, to be the one uh, introducing or discussing uh, Foucault with you in this longer series of the AISSR Great Thinkers uh, Seminars. I myself have enjoyed uh, a number of Great Thinkers Seminars so far, uh, and so I really like this sort of emerging tradition that AISSR has. Um, and for me, it's a privilege to be the one to be able to tell you about Foucault. Uh, and it's also a great challenge because, as um, Brian mentioned, Foucault uh, is important to many disciplines. And he's become appropriated <laughs> and read uh, in many different disciplines. Uh, and he's also appropriated in different ways in different disciplines, uh, which means that there's many uh, different Foucaults, uh, and I might be talking about a Foucault that you don't recognize very much, or who is not your Foucault. Uh, and so uh, it is also a challenge to do justice, and it's not just because of he's, he's been appropriated in many different disciplines, it's also because he wrote a lot. And he wrote a lot of different things, and some of them are not uh, entirely uh, compatible with the other. Or his thinking emerged and evolved over time, which is uh, normal, I think. Um, so what I would like to do is to talk to you uh, about some of the things that I like uh, very much about Foucault. I would like to explain to you some of the things that I find very useful, very inspirational, uh, uh, and I was going over, uh, again, over a lot of uh, his readings, his writings, uh, and I was rereading them in preparation for today, and I realized how much I really love Foucault, and how much <laughs> there is, uh, how much he has to offer, really, uh, for us uh, to think through, to think through power, to think through knowledge, uh, to think uh, through critique and resistance. Uh, and so what I would like to do is to give you a flavor of the things that I love most about him, uh, but also to give you uh, a lot of his words, sort of him talking to you in, uh, uh, in, in his own words. So I've collected uh, a whole a lot of quotes uh, to help you uh, um, well, understand or, or, or sort of start uh, seeing uh, some of the things uh, that... Um, uh, yeah, some, some of his major uh, ideas, I hope. Okay, just to start with some beginnings, uh, and immediately I have to say that Foucault didn't like the uh, idea of uh, origins, or he contested the notion of points of origin, because for him beginnings were always insecure, they were always multiple. Uh, uh, if we sort of go back in time and, and, and point to a definite beginning point, uh, we would not be doing justice to the complexity and the uncertainties of history. So to say that he was born in 1926 in a provincial French family, his father was a doctor, uh, it would be too much of sort of identifying this as a clear beginning of his being or his thinking. Um, nevertheless, I want to mention that he was born in 1926, he died in 1984 of, uh, of AIDS-related diseases. Um, and uh, I think it is interesting to sort of go back to how he himself talks about these early beginnings, uh, not origins. Um, because I was reading this interview with him in Speech Begins After Death, it's, a, it's an interview that was published, I think, um, uh, much later, but it's an interview in which he talks about writing. And he talks about what writing means to him. And he talks about how important the process of writing is to him. And he says that uh, um, by contrasting his own sort of writing practices to uh, the listening practices of his father. And his father was a doctor. So he says in this interview, and I quote, I come from a medical family. One of those provincial medical families that provides a relatively accommodating or progressive milieu. Uh, but nevertheless, the medical milieu remained, uh, in the provinces in France remained profoundly conservative. And then he says the physician listens. He does so to cut through the speech of the other and to reach the silent truth of the body. The physician doesn't speak. He acts. He feels. He intervenes. 
right? So he's contrasting his own practice of writing to his father's practice of listening. Uh, the physician uh, or the doctor uh, did not express himself, did not say very much. He listened and then he came with this kind of truth statement, this kind of um, uh, a diagnosis, this kind of uh, uh, intervention uh, of, of the truth of the body. Um, but uh, but first, so, so first in this in this sort of statement, he contrasts his own writing to the uh, to the listening practice of the physician. But then later on in that same interview, he starts drawing a parallel between his writing uh, and the practice of the physician uh, because he compares his writing uh, also to, <coughs> let's say, uh, a scalpel. And he compares his process of writing to uh, uh, making a diagnosis. So then he says, and this is the second <coughs> quote, in my writing, I am a doctor. I am like a doctor. I'm a diastognition. I want to make a diagnosis. And my work consists in revealing through the incision of writing. So he uh, compares his writing to, to a scalpel. And he says his writing makes a kind of incision and comes to a kind of diagnosis. Um, so I really like the way he talks about his own sort of beginnings here, uh, not just because he compares his practice of writing and analysis uh, to uh, uh, the, the, the practices of his father, but also, and I'm, I'm always fascinated myself uh, personally uh, uh, about the question how people come to their research topics uh, how people, especially when you when you do a PhD, how is it that you come to be fascinated with this, with this one, you know, obscure uh, theme or, or case uh, to fa for it to fascinate you for four years? And I'm always, um, you know, myself as uh, in, in a kind of amateur way thinking that it has to do with you know profound fascination that maybe also has to do sort of with your own uh, history and experiences. And here I also think that the fact that Foucault uh, went on to study psychology and psychiatry and started his first research looking and analyzing at the history of medical practices and psychiatric practices uh, uh, is also interesting in that uh, context of, uh, uh, of, of his own beginnings uh, and his, uh, the, the influence of, of his father's <coughs> profession uh, on his own experience and, and subject. So what he does is he goes to um, Paris. Uh, he studies psychology and psychiatry at the École Nationale Supérieure, and he becomes interested uh, in madness. Uh, uh, that uh, that disease that is not uh, understood to be a disease of the body. It's a disease that wasn't really taken seriously as a disease in comparison to the diseases of the body. <laughs> this disease of the mind. And he becomes uh, fascinated by the history of madness and, and, and the disease of the mind. And uh, after his studies, he starts uh, writing his, P, uh, his PhD, which later became uh, uh, translated as the history of madness, uh, but which in, in the version of his PhD manuscript, uh, Folie et des raisons, uh, Histoire de la fo uh, Folie, uh, uh, still has a very sort of different shape and form, is much longer and, and bigger than what eventually becomes translated translated as the history of madness. Um, and he's doing this research and he also takes it places. And so when he finishes his studies at the ENS, he doesn't at that point yet have his PhD, uh, but he becomes appointed uh, uh, to uh, uh, represent uh, France abroad in this kind of uh, institutions, uh, French institutions abroad, which, which is now you know, similar to Maison Descartes, which we have uh, in Amsterdam. And he goes different places, he goes to Hamburg, uh, he goes to uh, Warsaw uh, and he goes to Uppsala, which he loves Sweden. He goes there by Jaguar. He has this, you know, old, uh, uh, almost falling apart, really snazzy uh, car, Jaguar. He packs up his, uh, his French uh, books and uh, drives there from Paris to Uppsala. Uh, and he loves the library there and he loves the climate. Uh, um, uh, the, the intellectual climate, not the actual physical <laughs> climate. He doesn't like it at all, as he said. Um, but one thing that doesn't go so well in Uppsala is that the professor he is working with there uh, doesn't approve his PhD thesis. Uh, this is Professor Lindros, uh, who has not uh, been remembered as a great thinker in history, uh, as we said, uh, like Foucault himself has. But uh, in any case, Professor Lindros uh, 
uh, does not think that for Lee et des raisons uh, is quite up to the intellectual task of becoming a PhD manuscript. He doesn't approve Foucault's thesis. He says the thesis is full of speculative generalizations. You know, it has some interesting historical vignettes, and then it takes off in these sort of flights of philosophical fantasy. Uh, and he cannot, he, he, he likes it, he gets on with Foucault very well, but he cannot approve it as, you know, a thesis worthy of, uh, of the PhD. Um, and of course, uh, that's interesting. Uh, also from the point of view of the way in which Foucault's histories were received by historians, right? So this is the beginning of uh, Foucault's battle with historians who uh, also object uh, uh, to the generalizations and to the way in which he then uses the archives, which is, uh, which is, which is quite novel and uh, some would say speculative and some would say um, uh, uh, less speculative, but he, you know, he uses the archive in a different way, and he's um, a moderately, mildly accepted by historians to this day. Um, anyway, the Uppsala thing resolves itself. He goes back to Paris. He gets, this, uh, he, he does get his PhD uh, supported by uh, Kangouyem uh, at uh, uh, ENS in Paris in, in 61. Uh, and uh, like I said, uh, it becomes then eventually some of it becomes translated as the history of madness. And here are just, uh, I mean, he wrote a lot. There's also a lot of really interesting interviews to read, but these are just some of his major works and how uh, they have to uh, have been um, um, translated. And uh, yeah, I, I will not talk about all of them, but it just sort of gives you um, an idea. Okay, so what I like uh, to do is to try to use Foucault's own sort of instructions uh, as he likes his works to be used uh, and uh, to talk about them uh, from that starting point. So uh, he says at some point, and this is quoted in Stuart Eldon's book about Foucault, um, uh, Foucault says, well, I would like my books to be a kind of scalpel. Uh, to be like Molotov cocktails or undermining tunnels and to be burned up after use like fireworks. Um, so I really like this idea of uh, Foucault's uh, books being like Molotov cocktails uh, and I would like to throw a few Molotov cocktails or uh, uh, try to make a few little explosions uh, in this lecture. Um, uh, and I really like the way he sort of uh, uh, encourages us to, to, to use it and to burn it up uh, afterwards. And here again, uh, by the way, in this quote, you can see this notion of the scalpel, right? So it's back to the, to the medical um, uh, analogy where he talks about his writing as, as being this kind of um, almost like an abduction, you know, where he lays bare the cor the core, uh, the corpse, and uh, sort of takes it apart and, and, and lifts all the layers and sort of, uh, uh, makes an incision. Uh, uh, so, so, so again, here we have, well, we have a mix of, of metaphors here, but the scalpel and the sort of medical uh, metaphor is, is present here as well. We have a picture, unfortunately a little bit of a blurred picture, but this is Foucault with his long-term uh, partner Daniel Defer, who he was with for more than 25 uh, years uh, before, uh, before he died. Uh, I couldn't find any um, uh, much better pictures of them together, uh, but there is also a really good interview actually that you can watch on YouTube uh, by Daniel Defer, who himself uh, was also uh, uh, in the social sciences. Okay. So just to uh, take this idea of the Molotov cocktail uh, and to see how um, uh, Foucault's work, I think, did explode or try to explode some of uh, our received concepts, some of the ways in which we, uh, uh, we generally uh, think about uh, uh, big grand concepts in the social sciences. Uh, and I would like to talk about three points. Uh, first of them, the way in which Foucault sort of challenged the notion of ideology. Um, second, the way in which he exploded or undermined uh, or uh, uh, scalpeled uh, our notion of history. Uh, and third, uh, how he took apart or reoriented or undermined uh, the idea of government. Um, and then uh, finally, I want to talk a little bit about uh, his notions of critique, 
uh, or how he talks about recipes uh, for critique. Um, uh, but in a way, uh, critique and critical practice, I think, uh, is important throughout all of these three themes. So critique, in a way, is not something separate that comes sort of at the end, because I think all of his uh, investments and analyses, uh, to some extent, have an approach of critique in them, uh, but nevertheless I will draw uh, some of that out uh, at the end. So, to talk about explosion number one, uh, we have to see uh, the way in which he um, uh, helped us think uh, uh, from ideology to regimes of truth. Uh, and it's also important to understand uh, this move away from ideology to analyzing truth uh, in the context of the time, uh, the Marxist context of the time, the, the 1960s and the 1970s in Paris or in Western Europe more generally, uh, where there's a lot of discussions about ideology, uh, where Marx is read, uh, the beginnings of uh, uh, or, or sort of um, the importance of the Communist Party uh, as well uh, in Europe at the time, especially among left-leaning uh, intellectuals. Um, so there's a lot of discussions going on about ideology, about class politics. Um, and then uh, Foucault comes and he sort of throws a Molotov cocktail at this notion of ideology and he says, well, I'm not interested in ideology, I'm interested in the production and the operation of truth. Uh, and uh, what does that mean? Um, that means for him, truth is both much more and much less than ideology. Uh, uh, truth is, is the production of effective instruments for the formation and accumulation of knowledge. Methods for observation, techniques for, of registration, procedures for investigation. So what happens here in this move from ideology to truth um, is uh, that he unpacks or he makes us uh, attentive to the relationship between truth and power. And so he makes it very clear throughout all his writings that there is an intimate relation uh, between truth and power. Um, but at the same time, he problematizes uh, this notion of a clear interest behind truth, right? Which ideology has that uh, uh, assumption, I find. Uh, ideology sort of assumes that there's a particular distortion of reality at work and that this, that the distortion of reality uh, is also in the interest or purposefully designed by specific interests uh, against the interests of others. Um, uh, ideology also has a notion of false consciousness uh, in it, which sort of assumes that if we can cut through the ideological uh, layers of the way in which the world appears to us, that we can actually sort of see the real interests, eh? which is of course also to some extent very much a Marxist starting point, that you can strip the layers of, uh, uh, of, of ideology uh, to get at uh, the real sort of class interest or to lay bare uh, the real class interests. Um, and uh, Foucault uh, challenges this notion. Uh, he says, I'm not interested in ideology as a distortion of the truth. Uh, I'm not interested in sort of taking away or stripping away this layer of ideology from reality, but I'm interested in understanding the historical production of truth itself, uh, which also then changes the way in which we think about interests, uh, because if truth is produced, uh, that doesn't mean that there are uh, necessarily nefarious interests sort of behind the production of truth um, uh, or, or driving uh, the production uh, of, of, of truth as a distorted reality in a particular way. That doesn't mean that there is no power. On the contrary, power circulates through the production of truth uh, uh, at all levels. And it doesn't mean that there is no domination. Uh, so still people may uh, benefit from regimes of truth more than others. Uh, but he takes away this, this sort of, I guess, implicit assumption that, uh, uh, that truth is distorted in favor of particular interest in a kind of um, uh, deliberate way. Um, so he directs us to uh, studying the accumulation of knowledge, uh, methods of uh, observation, registration, investigation, uh, and he 
encourages then uh, us, or uh, and also this is what uh, very much what he did himself. He uh, uh, wants to study the how of power, how power operates, the mechanisms of its application, the points of its exercise, its real and effective practices, it, its infinitesimal mechanisms, and this is from uh, the two lectures. So he then. Um, Helps, helps us or moves towards uh, an understanding of the politics of the technical, which I think is also one of the things that is still really useful uh, and inspiring about uh, Foucault's work, is that uh, he uh, directs us to the politics of the things that seem apolitical, uh, uh, that seem technical, that seem uh, uncontested. Um, and if you ever read uh, uh, the uh, first pages of Discipline and Punish, you get a nice flavor of, uh, of, of what he does there. And if you haven't read them, uh, you should. Um, because what he does in the first pages of Discipline and Punish is he contrasts this uh, 18th century practice of quartering uh, Damien, who was uh, accused of, uh, of regicide, uh, and he was quartered in a public spectacle. And it gets really gory, it's a really gory description of this public quartering. Um, uh, and uh, Foucault sort of asks, well, what happens to the body of the condemned in this public spectacle? And he, uh, uh, he sort of recounts this public spectacle of the quartering. But then he says, a few pages later, he says, 80 years later, Léon Fouché drew up his rules for the house of young prisoners in Paris. And these rules for the house of young prisoners in Paris, they're very sort of technical, apolitical. They start with, well, the prisoner's day begins at 6 in the morning and at, uh, in the winter and at 5 in the summer. They work so many hours a day. Uh, uh, they have dinner uh, at that time. Um, they, uh, they dress in a particular way, uh, they, uh, they um, you know, it's a, it's a really fine-grained timetable of the prisoner's day, uh, which arises uh, less than a hundred years later than, you know, this public spectacle of the quartering. So Foucault asks well, what happens in between uh, the time, what happens in these hundred years? How come uh, first you have to have a public spectacle in order to punish, when less than a hundred years later you have this kind of technical approach, you have this timetable, you have you know rule books, you have degrees, you have registers. It's not public. It becomes very sort of technological. And here he's, he becomes increasingly interested in, in unpacking the politics of this technical approach, of the technical. Um, uh, ordering, not just the technical ordering of the timetable of the day, but also the spatial ordering of the bodies in space and how uh, the body of the prisoner is moved uh, from one place to another and, and regulated and how the technical works upon the body. Um, so a lot of his work uh, uh, is about this politics of the technical, analyzes the degrees and the registers and the jurisprudence rather than sort of the grand gestures of, of public politics. Um, and why is that important uh, in uh, uh, the discussions of the day? Actually, this is a long quote, uh, but I need to skip it uh, in the interest of time. But I, um, uh, I included it uh, because it says something. Uh, well, maybe just uh, the, the, the little uh, part that is highlighted, because here he talks about, you know, some, someone at some point asks him, well, what role does social class then play? And when you start analyzing the politics of the technical, how can we still talk about grand structures like social class, which of course uh, is very much on everybody's uh, mind in the uh, in, in, in sort of left-leaning Paris at the time. Um, and then Foucault says, uh, uh, well, uh, can one talk of interests here? He says, to say that there was a sort of imperialist dynamic of psychiatry aiming to annex crime and submit it to its rationality doesn't get us anywhere, right? So he's interested, uh, um, he, he, he sort of takes us away from this idea of social class and social uh, and interests. Uh, and he says, well, we could say that there is an imperialist dynamic, but it just doesn't get us anywhere. It doesn't get us to understand uh, the practices uh, of, of what is going on.
Okay, I'm going to um, move to uh, uh, the little explosion number two, where Foucault sort of challenges and changes uh, what uh, we mean by history or uh, how we study history. And, uh, you know, it's a little Molotov cocktail. He didn't entirely, you know, succeed uh, in reoriented historic, uh, uh, history, no, nor should he necessarily. And I've already mentioned a little bit uh, his ongoing contestation with, uh, with historians who do not necessarily um, uh, agree with his approach and his methods. Um, but for him, history was too often a quest for origins. Um, he critiqued hist historical sciences because he said historical sciences often make it sound like there's this point of origin and then there's this linear development up until the present day. Uh, but if you, um, uh, if you represent history in this kind of linear fashion, you also sort of <laughs> naturalize the things that are today. Uh, you make it sound like they, uh, uh, like they emerged in a kind of natural or evolutionary way uh, and you write out all the sort of complexities and vicissitudes and all the strangeness that was necessary uh, uh, to be eradicated for things to be as they presently are. So instead of doing history, he uh, advocated that we should do genealogy. Uh, and genealogy not meant in the sense of tracing your family tree, but genealogy meant in the sense of uh, doing a history that is not linear, uh, a history that is sort of attentive to all the strangeness and all the roads not taken, uh, and a history that is itself always a practice of critique. So when he talks about genealogy, he says uh, the following. He says, it is fruitful in a certain way to describe that which is by making it appear as something that might not be or that might not be as it is, right? So he, um, he encourages us to, uh, uh, to denaturalize the present uh, by looking at uh, particular histories, especially strange and weird and awkward histories that had to sort of be forgotten, uh, the roads not taken in history uh, uh, to get us where we are in the present. Um, so he says, history serves to show how that which is has not always been, that the things which seem most evident to us are always formed in the confluence of encounters and chances during the course of a precarious and fragile history. Right, so he says, uh, by looking at the fragile history of the present, we can also critique the present, we can denaturalize the present, we can understand how the present and some of the things that seem more, most normal and most natural to us today maybe have really convoluted and uncertain and fragile histories and if we sort of remember and recognize those fragile histories we might also understand those naturalized borders to be fragile and changeable in the present. So he says on the genealogy, he says, for example, the genealogy will never neglect as inaccessible the vicissitudes of history. On the contrary, it will cultivate the details and accidents that accompany its every beginning. It will be scrupulously attentive to their petty malice. Right, so he encourages us to go out and find not sort of the big, uh, the big lines of history, but you know the petty and uncertain and malicious kind of weirdness uh, in histories uh, that make uh, the present seem more fragile. Um, and that is what I tried a little bit to do in my book, Virtue, Fortune and Faith, which was my PhD thesis and then later became published as a book. Um, and uh, I called it a genealogy of finance, though uh, I will also uh, tell you honestly that doing a genealogy, no matter how compelling Foucault makes it sound, uh, is really, really difficult uh, because it is really difficult to actually uh, write a history that does not seem linear. Uh, but what I tried to do in the book, and it was uh, a, a, sort of a, a history of speculative practices, uh, and I tried to unearth some of the uncertain, fragile, uh, uh, 
political and moral debates that uh, took place about finance uh, in history uh, uh, to, uh, to help critique or make strange or denaturalize financial practices as we know them today. And so one of the things I did was to look at uh, the historical relation and the historical debates about the relation between gambling uh, and speculation and finance. Uh, and when you do so, you actually find that for much of history, it was very difficult to make a separation between gambling and finance, which, which was really a, a big problem for the political regulation of financial markets. Uh, it was a big problem for enforcing uh, legal financial contracts, for example, yeah, because gambling, gambling contracts cannot uh, be legitimately enforced, uh, but speculative contracts and, and the history of financial markets depended on the enforceability of contracts. Uh, so this was a big problem for the history uh, of finance, uh, that uh, the distinction between gambling and finance could not be properly made in politics or in law or in morality. Uh, and one of the things I try uh, to do in the book is to sort of unpack and go back to those historical discussions between gambling and finance and that sort of uncertain and repetitive and very complicated boundary drawing between gambling and finance uh, that never really sort of succeeded. Hey, you know, today, uh, whenever we have a crisis, people start shouting, gambling, you know, this is gambling, this is just a big casino. Um, so that boundary was never uh, really properly drawn. And what I try to do in the book is with this kind of gene genealogical approach uh, to unearth some of the vicissitudes of histories, some of the fragile beginnings, uh, some of the, the, the weirdness and strangeness of these historical uh, financial debates uh, um, to try to also uh, make strange or at least uh, render cr uh, critique uh, in the present. Uh, another thing I looked at, uh, for example, was the history of um, stock market indices, uh, where, uh, uh, and then in particular the Dow Jones, which for a long time had the Dow Jones Industrial Average, which for a long time was the sort of stock mark, uh, market index uh, that we know. Uh, and again, there I tried to look at its insecure beginnings, uh, the contestations over the beginning of this index, how something which now seems so normal, it seems like such a major benchmark for the markets and for financial performance, was actually in its uh, sort of complex and uh, uncertain origins, something that was you know, thought to be unacceptable and really strange, and it took a long time for it to become um, uh, sort of uh, a, a generalized accepted measure of market performance, for example. So I tried to unpack some of the contestations over, uh, uh, over the history of, of financial instruments and, and financial regulation. So then to move to uh, little explosion uh, number three, uh, which is where uh, Foucault uh, moves uh, away from thinking about government toward thinking about governmentality uh, and what in his later work then uh, becomes uh, called security. So governmentality and security, apart from maybe a few finer points, uh, I think uh, is the same thing except uh, 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 conveyed uh, in different writings and in different English language editions of his, his lectures. Because here also you get into uh, some of the material that was published after he died. Um, uh, and, and, and some of this uh, is really based on lectures he was giving uh, uh, around the time of, of, of his death and not uh, books like Discipline and Punish and History of Madness which were published during his lifetime. Uh, but the material on governmentality largely was um, uh, translated and published uh, on the basis of lectures he gave uh, and, and lectures that were uh, recorded. But what he does with the move from government to governmentality is also, again, reorient the things we look at when we think about power, when we think about governing. Um, and he said the thing to look at uh, and the way that power operates is not necessarily uh, through the operations of the sovereign. Uh, 
right? We're thinking about, uh, uh, we're used to thinking about government as the operation of the sovereign and the king or the government which edits uh, decrees and laws and that's how power operates, that's how politics works. Um, uh, but he sort of reoriented our understanding of how power works and how politics works uh, uh, by making us think about uh, practices of normalization, practices of discipline, and practices of governmentality. Uh, and governmentality is very closely related to the birth of statistics. Um, and statistics for him were state-istics, in the sense that statistics were, and modern statistics as we know them, uh, uh, were also uh, started to be compiled uh, in the service of the state. And so the history of st statistics is inseparable uh, from uh, the history of modern uh, political uh, governing, um, excuse me, and he says uh, slowly in the 17th and 18th century, you will also find this actually uh, in the work of someone like Ian Hacking, but he says uh, slowly people start compiling tables and graphs and uh, information on what then comes to be understood as the population. Uh, and once we start recording information on deaths and diseases and, uh, uh, and uh, births, uh, we start seeing uh, that death and disease and birth has its own sort of cycles of operation. Uh, uh, and this gradually reveals, he says, uh, that the population has its own regularities its own rate of death and diseases, its cycles of scarcity. Statistics shows that the domain of population involves a range of intrinsic aggregate effects, phenomena that are irreducible to those of the family, such as epidemics, endemic levels of mortality, ascending spirals of labor and wealth. Lastly, it shows that through its shifts, customs, activities, etc., population has specific economic effects. Right? So he says that governing uh, uh, moves away from governing a territory. Uh, he said in, you know, in the sort of pre-modern times, the sovereign was preoccupied with governing his territory. He said modern governing uh, is about governing the population. And how we, do we know the population? We know the population through the birth and through the compilation of statistics. And so once we start compiling statistics, we are able to identify these sort of cycles of regularity <laughs> Um, uh, and once we start doing so, uh, that means that uh, 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 there is a means of acting upon the population. We can try to, to, to regulate uh, and steer these uh, cycles of, uh, of, of regularity of the population. We can try to intervene in the cycles of death and birth and disease, uh, uh, which, uh, uh, which is a type of governing he then comes to uh, call uh, governmentality. And governmentality is not just about uh, uh, the state sort of regulating these cycles uh, of, uh, of the population, but it's also about uh, um, uh, the development of notions of normality, right? And, uh, um, and the sense that uh, uh, there is a normal or there is a norm to which uh, the population, um, uh, th that there is a norm and a normality in these cycles of regularity to which we then all start to inspire. That is something that we sort of internalize this notion of normality uh, and start to uh, act upon ourselves as well. Later on he starts uh, calling, or actually a security territory population, uh, and some of the lectures uh, associated uh, uh, with that uh, uh, book, um, uh, he starts calling this security. and he. Uh, makes uh, a distinction between discipline as a practice of power and security. And for him, security is a mode of power uh, that refers to a series of possible events, that refers to the temporal and the uncertain, uh, which have to be inserted within a given space. Uh, so for him, security is also a way uh, of acting on probabilities of uh, uh, governing through risk, uh, governing through statistics, and governing through uh, understandings of, of risk and probability, um, uh, which then um, uh, emerges as a kind of future-oriented governing. Okay. So, um, back to... Um, Foucault's uh, own understanding of what he tries to do. Uh, I've talked about, you know, how he sees himself as uh, throwing some Molotov cocktails or 
uh, how he sees his writing as a kind of scalpel. Uh, somewhere else he says, I do not conceive of what I have done as an oeuvre. I'm shocked that one can call oneself a writer. I'm an instrument maker, a recipe maker, a guide to objectives, objectives a cartographer, an armorer, right? So again, he's sort of reorienting uh, the thing that uh, he sees himself as doing. He gives us uh, cartographies, he gives us recipes, uh, uh, rather than, um, you know, building up this one oeuvre. And I've talked about uh, these three moves uh, from, from ideology to regimes of truth, from history to genealogy, and from government to governmentality. And I just want to uh, finish in the last five minutes or so uh, with his um, uh, recipes or, or cartographies of, uh, of critique and critical thinking. And like I said before, critique uh, is at work throughout uh, all of these three points uh, that I've mentioned. Um, uh, it's not something that sort of comes after or that is separate from, especially in the genealogy, it's very clearly uh, a critical practice. Um, but I do think it's important to talk about critique a bit more explicitly, especially because somehow, uh, sometimes, uh, Foucault is remembered as someone uh, uh, who was not one of the great uh, critics uh, of his time. Uh, partly, uh, I think that was uh, because he was not in Paris in May uh, 1968, which was, of course, you know, the big uh, sort of watershed in, uh, uh, in Western European history. And he was not in Paris in May 68. He was uh, at that time working in Tunis uh, at the university, where there was also a student protest and a strike, which you know accounts differ slightly to what extent he supported uh, the, the strike, uh, the student strike in Tunis. But he did uh, actually, according to his biographer David Macy, he did have to leave uh, Tunisia. Uh, because he was also uh, supporting uh, the students uh, who were rising up against the state and he gave one of them a ride in his car and then he started getting in trouble with the police. So anyway, David Macy also says that he sort of liked to retell this story of how dangerous that was uh, to compensate for the fact that he wasn't in um, Paris in May 68. But anyway, I think partly, strangely, um, Foucault is remembered, or sometimes remembered, as someone who was not uh, one of the great uh, critics of the day. Uh, uh, but I th so I think it is important to point out how, in many ways, he was very politically involved, uh, and he was politically involved in a way which uh, he later started calling um, uh, this uh, uh, something of specificity. He starts uh, 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 writing about something or someone that he calls the specific intellectual. And for him, the specific intellectual is someone who intervenes on the basis of his own expertise, uh, rather than someone who tries to do this kind of universalist exegesis or a universalist uh, sense of right and wrong, uh, which for him uh, was embodied by someone like Sartre, uh, but against this notion of the universalist intellectual who would know about right and wrong in the abstract, he places this figure of the specific intellectual who is able to to intervene specifically into ongoing historical struggles on the basis of his specific expertise. Uh, and I, I like this idea very much of the specific in intellectual. Uh, and it is also significant from that point of view. I mean, he was actually involved in many different kinds of uh, uh, um, uh, critiques. He was always like uh, writing letters to Le Monde, uh, and he was always like signing public uh, petitions or organizing public petitions. Um, also uh, on behalf of migrant rights, uh, also against the war in Vietnam. Uh, some of his major political involvement was for the Group d'Information sur les Prisons, uh, which was uh, a group uh, uh, that uh, uh, strived for prisoners' rights, both conditions in the prison, uh, and it sort of gathered information about conditions in the prisons also through uh, um, uh, through uh, questionnaires, uh, first-hand accounts uh, of uh, what it was like to be in prison, uh, but also on behalf of uh, uh, political prisoners. So, um, so I think that is important because it is related to his research. So there was a clear relationship between his research areas uh, and his actual uh, political engagements. Um, and he also says, 
uh, we must escape from the dilemma of being for or, or against in a sort of abstract way. Reforms are not produced uh, out of thin air. Uh, uh, practice uh, reforms are always for him um, sort of anchored into ongoing uh, political practices, right? We cannot place ourselves above uh, the practice uh, uh, of the thing that we critique, uh, but our critique is always anchored into something that is already ongoing uh, uh, and, and, and it doesn't make uh, the world uh, anew. Um, so I think it is important to, to point out the, the intimate relation between his research and his research topics uh, uh, and his actual political involvement. Uh, and then uh, later on in his life, he is also more involved in um, health groups and uh, uh, campaign groups for, for sexual rights. He was not himself very outspoken on homosexual rights uh, and gay rights, uh, with some exceptions uh, sort of later in his life, uh, uh, but he does also become um, uh, involved in uh, groups striving for health rights, uh, sexual rights, abortion, and so on. Okay, so uh, just uh, to end on this notion uh, of critique, uh, and he uh, contests, this is from uh, The Will to Knowledge, uh, he contests this idea that there is a great review, so a clear binary of yes or no. Uh, he says, there is no locus of great refusal, no soul of revolt. There is a plurality, a plurality of resistances, each of them a special case. Some of them are possible, necessary, unprobable. Others that are spontaneous, savage, solitary. Still others that are quick to compromise, interested or sacrificial. Uh, but all of them, uh, so he, he says there are sometimes radical ruptures, it is not the case that you do not have in history radical ruptures, but more often critique has to anchor itself and intervene in ongoing uh, political practices uh, and anchor itself in existing uh, fields of forces, uh, which also makes the effects of critique and political involvement to some extent uh, unpredictable. Okay. So I'll leave it here, and I'm happy to take some questions. Questions? Comments? Molotov cocktails? <laughs> okay, not really Molotov cocktails. I'm not allowed to say that. <laughs> Uh, right in the back. Uh, towards the beginning, I, I 